Okay. All right. Very good. All right. On three, two, one. Hello, and welcome to the American Museum of Tort Law video series. I'm your host, Rick Newman, Executive Director of the Museum, with a question for you. Have you ever wanted to become a federal criminal? Have you ever been curious about what you would need to do to achieve that goal? It's not as difficult as you might think. And today, we have someone who can give us some helpful tips. Our guest today is Mike Chase, attorney and author of the brilliant and very funny book, How to Become a Federal Criminal. Hi, Mike. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, tell us a little about this book. How did this come about? Well, so I started a Twitter feed back in 2014 with a simple mission, which was I'm going to try and count every single federal crime on the books because nobody had ever been able to do it before, including our own government. And so I started doing it. And then about a few years in, I realized I've got a whole bunch of backstory and research behind how we ended up with potentially more than 300,000 federal crimes on the books. So maybe I need to do a little bit of an explanation. Plus, I always thought that there was a missing void in American life for the definitive how-to manual to commit the most ridiculous federal crimes that are possible. And so I just wanted to fill that void. That's right. It's a long overdue need. Right. Tell us the name of the book and where can you get it? So the name of the book is How to Become a Federal Criminal, an Illustrated Handbook for the Aspiring Offender. It is what it promises to be. It's a fully illustrated handbook on how to commit America's most ridiculous federal crimes. And you can get it at independent bookstores. So you can go to bookshop. Uh, .org is a great place. You can go right to the Simon & Schuster website or Amazon, Barnes & Noble. But I hope when uh, everything lifts and we're all out of our houses, we'll be able to go get it at our best uh, independent bookstores near us. Excellent. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it's my pleasure to give you Mike Chase with useful tips on how to become a federal criminal. Thanks. Thanks. So it's really an honor to, to be here and be able to uh, have this discussion, you know, not a lot of people wake up every morning deciding that they want to become a federal criminal, but a lot of people wake up in the morning becoming a federal criminal without knowing that they're doing it. Um, and part of this research, again, is the book is lighthearted and satirical, and its main mission, again, the book is dedicated to Congress um, because they're hilarious. They, you know, I, I'm, I'm just the messenger. They wrote all the good material. And so the, what I like to do is I like to talk about, all right, we've got potentially as many as 300,000 federal crimes. Why do we have so many federal crimes? Um, so I'm just going to go through a, a little bit of a, a backstory of how we ended up where we ended up, how it is that I'm able to, uh, to write the book that I wrote. And uh, you can see just coming up here, I've got a presentation that I like to call 300,000 Ways to Become a Federal Criminal. And I think one of the best examples we can start out with is right here on the screen. And you might be asking yourself, where's the crime? Okay, can you spot the crime? Is it that message, keep away from children? I don't know, it looks like a pretty typical matchbook. What if I told you very helpfully, it's a 16 CFR 1202.4H violation, right? That makes it very easy. Everybody just goes to that place in their head and they say, oh yeah, 1202.4H. I know that federal regulation and where to find it and what it means. Well, you should know, you should know what it is because violations are punishable by up to five years in federal prison. You wanna know where the crime is? Well, it's right there. 16 CFR 1202.4H says that any staple used as an assembly device for securing the cover of, and combs of a matchbook shall be fully clinched, fully clinched, so that the ends are flattened or turned into the cover. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that anything less than a full clinch is a federal crime. A half clinch, a loose clinch, a pretty good clinch on your matchbook, not enough. You need a full clinch. And who decides? Well, of course, the federal government decides. Now, the way this works is those are federal regulations, okay? Those are promulgated in the Code of Federal Regulations. But they have to get some authority from somewhere, right? That's an agency. They're not Congress. Well, there's two statutes that are very important, 15 U.S.C. 2068 and 15 U.S.C. 2070. 2068 is what Congress passed that just says it's illegal for anybody to make a consumer product that's not in conformity with applicable consumer product safety rules. Look, anybody who's been to the tort museum knows that product safety is very important. People can get hurt when people are irresponsible. And so Congress made another statute that said 15 U.S.C. 2070. 
any violation is punishable by imprisonment for not more than five years for a knowing and willful violation. Well, okay, great. But that's all that's in the statute books. If you look in the statute book and you go to find where the law is, it just says don't violate rules for consumer product safety. You have to go to a whole nother place to find out about staple clinching. So here's a good example. 15 USC 2068, that prohibits non-compliance with regs. 15 USC 2070, that makes it a federal crime. And then you get down to 16 CFR 1202.4H. And that's why if you really want to know where the crime is, it's 15 USC sections 2068 and 2070 plus 16 CFR 1202.4H make it a federal crime to sell a matchbook with an unclinched staple. Now, what does that look like if you wanted to go research the law, right? You might want to sit down and you say, boy, I don't want to go to federal prison. I think I need to figure out what all the laws are. Well, you can't necessarily do that. This is all that Congress passed. Remember, we just read that statute. The, about four lines, that's everything that Congress passed. Bicameral process, House, Senate, President signed it. That's what went into law. But this is what an agency passed. This page, this page, this page, and this page of federal matchbook regulations alone. So all of these are the federal matchbook regulations. That's a lot of regs, there's a lot of rules. Um, now this all came about because there was a time where there were about 6,800 matchbook related hospitalizations a year. And this is America after all, so we shouldn't be surprised that people's pants were catching on fire and matchbook heads were flying into people's eyes and all kinds of things like that. But then after they passed the federal matchbook regulations, you'd be happy to know that those 6,800 or so matchbook related injuries dropped down to about 6,000 matchbook related injuries. So after all of that work, we, uh, we still have some matchbook related hospitalizations, but not as many as we had before. But if you're looking on the screen, you can see this, uh, this chart, which shows how it is that you go from having few crimes to so many crimes, by way of regulation. Since the 1950s, there's been an exponential growth in the total pages in the Code of Federal Regulations. In there, you've got extremely important stuff. You've got a lot of stuff that has protected people from you know, dying from food allergies, but you've also got um, federal standards for how yellow butter needs to be, uh, or, or, or what colors margarine or shapes margarine can't legally be sold in. Um, but that's how you end up with all of these crimes, and that's what enables me to be able to tweet one every single day, every single day, for the last almost six years. So here I've made a helpful diagram that shows, you know, my progress towards tweeting every single federal crime uh, on the books. And if you look, I started in July of 2014. By July of 2018, I had made all of that progress indicated in green. So that's, I think I'm doing pretty good. I should be completed if I still do one every single day, and if Congress and regulators don't make any new crimes, I'll be done by February of 2848. So I'm in, I'm in good shape, I think, to finish, and I'm just gonna keep going at the same pace. What are some examples of crimes I tweet? Well, for example, it's a federal crime to sell canned fruit cocktail with less than 2% cherries. Of course, of course it is. Uh, it's also a federal crime to sell athletes foot cream without telling that users that they need to pay special attention to the spaces between their toes. And, you know, the funny thing is I've always wondered, how is it that you could know that you needed to get athletes foot cream, but you'd be totally lost on where to put it? Well, federal regulators decided it was best to just make that decision and put it on the tube. And in fact, an interesting story about this regulation is that at the same time that this regulation was coming into being, uh, they were also passing federal rules for jock itch cream. And jock itch cream uh, has its own special regulations which say you can't put it in your eyes. And a, a guy went to the regulator when they proposed the regulation and he said, do we really need to tell people that they shouldn't put jock itch cream in their eyes? Because frankly, nobody should be putting jock itch cream anywhere near their eyes. And the ultimate decision of the agency was it's probably better to just put it in because we don't want to take any risks. There's other federal crimes that relate to fun things like typography, right? It's a federal crime to sell earplugs if their noise reduction rating isn't written in Helvetica medium. Well, what does that mean? Helvetica bold is a federal crime. Helvetica italic, that's also a federal crime, at least in this instance. Now, 
for any of those typography snobs out there, there is good news because under this rule, it is technically a federal crime to use the font Comic Sans, okay? So that is a, we've finally gotten there in America where you can't use Comic Sans. And it even gets kind of meta, right? You, it's a federal crime to violate the St. Lawrence Seaway regulations simply by not having a copy of the St. Lawrence Seaway regulations with you while you pass through the St. Lawrence Seaway. So even not ha having copies of the law with you is a violation of the law under some circumstances. How do we get here? Well, if you wanna go way back, you go back to Article One, Section One of the Constitution, which said all legislative powers are vested in Congress, meaning Congress and Congress alone is supposed to make the law. But the US Constitution identified just three crimes of federal concern. Remember, states were able to make their own crimes and that's where still to this day, most crimes are prosecuted. But the founders, when they wrote the Constitution, they said, there's three things that we're really concerned about. Piracy, okay, don't be a pirate, easy enough. Counterfeiting, don't make fake money, fine. Treason, right? Those are the three federal crimes. But then, and you can see them right there in the, in the Constitution, that's, that's all of the reference to federal crime in the Constitution. But then in the Crimes Act of 1790, Congress said, you know, we actually need a little bit more than three crimes. So we're gonna pass the first set of federal criminal statutes. And it enumerated about 20 federal crimes, but it was still mostly pirate stuff, counterfeiting and treason. And in fact, it wasn't just a federal crime anymore to be a pirate. It was also a federal crime to entertain a pirate or to hide a pirate. So this is the point in the presentation where I always tell everybody, if you have any pirates at home, you need to get rid of them right away because it is still a federal crime to hide a pirate in your house, so don't do that. And it's also a federal crime still to receive or entertain or consult with a pirate. So to any stand-up comedians out there, if you ever find a pirate laughing at your jokes, you need to stop right away and call a lawyer because you have committed a federal crime. But then Congress sort of started doing some weirder stuff. And if you look up on the screen, you can see the example that we talked about with uh, athletes foot cream, right? The regulators in Congress, they said, we wanna make sure that people pay special attention to the area between their toes. But what about here? If you look at this, this is an actual congressional transcript during the time of the potential Nixon impeachment, when Congress was actually debating a new law, which was gonna make it a federal crime to say, give a hoot, don't pollute. And that remains a federal crime today. If you don't know Woodsy Owl, Woodsy Owl is sort of like a, a knockoff version of Smokey the Bear. And Woodsy Owl goes around and he says he doesn't want people polluting. But under the federal law, if you say, give a hoot, don't pollute, and you don't get the permission of the Secretary of Agriculture, you're looking at about six months in federal prison. So to further answer that question of how we got here with all these federal crimes that you might not anticipate. Well, Congress regulated weirder and weirder stuff, not just Woodsy Owl and not just athletes foot cream, but early on, they passed a federal statute called an act defining butter. And this is like one of the most legislative masterpieces of all time. Congress spent days of hearings, days and days of hearings, just to figure out what the federal definition of butter should be. And they made all kinds of crimes about selling non-compliant butter. But why would they do that? Was it because Congress was really focused on making sure that butter was heavily regulated? Well, not necessarily. What it actually was is that margarine was coming onto the scene. And the butter industry was very threatened by margarine. It was cheaper, it was every bit as yellow, and most people could not tell the difference when they put it on their toast. And so the butter industry, the dairy lobby, went to Washington and demanded that federal the federal regulators, and essentially then it was the, the Commissioner of Revenue, but really Congress pass a federal criminal statute that would make it a crime for anybody to sell yellow margarine. And so for a long time in the United States, when you got margarine, it was white, and you had to either add with a tube of coloring, or in some states, if you sold margarine, it was required to be pink in color. And at one point, a, uh, a representative from the margarine industry went to Congress and when he was testifying, they said, why is it that they've made it a law that, uh, that you have to sell pink margarine? And he said that he believes that it's because no 
no man would ever spread a pink substance on his toast. And so that's how we ended up with a federal statute criminalizing the sale of yellow margarine, which primarily remains on the books today, although it can be yellow. Um, but if you want to sell margarine, or you give out margarine in a restaurant in individual serving sizes, it is still a law that it's a federal crime to give out non-triangular pats of margarine. And for anybody who's in Connecticut and interested in this and say, that, well, do people ever actually get prosecuted for this stuff? The answer to that is yes, because right here in Hartford, Connecticut, a guy named Joseph Trowaski was hauled out of his restaurant and arrested for a second offense of giving out non-triangular margarine back in the 1950s. So it has happened. Uh, they also regulated things like out-of-state dentures and even made it a federal crime to bathe in the hot springs in Arkansas without a doctor's note saying that you needed to bathe in the hot springs of Arkansas. And this is sort of how it ends up looking. These are cover pages from pages and pages and pages of congressional hearings where people have come to Congress and testified and submitted documents all to get these laws passed. And so what about this law that prohibits the interstate commerce and dentures? Well, that was because dentists were getting run out of business by some entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in Chicago who came up with a dentures by mail company. And the way it worked was if you if you wanted the dentures, you wrote it off to them. They would then mail you a gob of wax. You'd boil it in some water, shove it in your mouth, and bite down really hard. And then you'd mail the gob of wax back to them, and they'd make dentures from them. Well, the problem was these dentures were actually pretty good. And people thought they were a great fit, and they were a lot cheaper than having to go from a rural community into the city to have dentures made. And so the, the Dentists Association, the American Dental Association, was feeling threatened. So again, they ended up getting a federal criminal statute passed. National Organ Transplant Act was days and days of hearings to tell us that we can't sell our own organs. Mailing of dangerous martial arts weapons was interesting. You may remember back in the 80s, there was something called Ninja Mania. Uh, Karate Kid was out. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was out. And there were people that were terrified, terrified, that school-aged kids were going to be coming to school with throwing stars and nunchucks and bow staffs in their backpacks. And so a guy from Massachusetts went down to Washington and he did a nunchucks demonstration on the floor of, of the Senate and demanded that they make it a federal crime to mail ninja weapons. And uh, you'll be happy to know that that law did not get passed. Um, that died in committee. And so there are now no federal prohibitions on ninja weapons. So feel free to carry your nunchucks across state lines and your throwing stars that that's totally legal. But then what about all the way down here, you see this Switchblade Knives Act. How did the Switchblade Knives Act get passed and what does it provide? Well, you can't travel across state lines with a switchblade knife unless you fall into one of two categories. One, if you uh, are in the military, you can have a switchblade knife. Or two, if you only have one arm, you're allowed to have a switchblade knife under federal law, that's an exception. So one-armed civilians uh, can have switchblade knives and folks in the military, but if you have both of your arms and you're just a civilian, you're out of luck. Now, why did this get passed? Well, I don't know for sure, but I will tell you in 1958, it was passed. And in 1957, West Side Story uh, debuted. So I don't, I, I would never suggest that Congress was afraid of roving bands of dancing, singing gang members, wielding switchblade knives, but they did pass that statute uh, really quickly. Now, this is the kind of stuff that gets submitted to Congress, right? This is what the ad for those dentures, those mail-away dentures look like. And you can see, I mean, by any standard, $7.95 is cheap for a set of dentures. But this is, this is what got submitted. And the American Dental Association, right here, you can see there was this testimony. And the, the, the ADA was saying, look, this is a pernicious practice. You know, it's basically legal where these out-of-state dentures can get mailed in, and it's, it's running us out of town. But it was a lobbying effort. It wasn't because there was actually any kind of person getting hurt. It was about competition. There was no current criminal law being broken. What these folks in Illinois were doing was totally legal. It was, it was like the Netflix of dentures. They were cutting edge. And yet the American Dental Association went to Congress to get a federal criminal statute passed under federal postal jurisdiction trying to stamp out a competitor. And you know what ended up happening? Those two women from Chicago who came up with this practice, well, they were prosecuted and they both became federal criminals because of this 
this, uh, this statue. So they were running a wildly successful, innovative business that was helping a community. People submitted letters to Congress saying, these are the best dentures I ever had. But a powerful organization was able to go make a federal criminal statute and put some entrepreneurs in prison because they were competitors. And so even today, if you go to 18 USC 1821, there it is, it's still a statute, it's still a federal crime to engage in uh, out-of-state denture transportation. All right, so what does that look like in practice? Well, we talked about the matchbook example early on that you have a very simple statute and then you have a bunch of federal regulations that get passed. And uh, what does it look like on the books? Well, take for example, this statute. This is the one I was talking about before where Congress made it a crime to do any of the things, to, 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 to fail to do any of the things required by law when it comes to margarine. And in fact, in 1896, a margarine dealer was sentenced to prison because he didn't write his name and address on the margarine that he sold. There was another margarine dealer right around that same time who was also prosecuted. And his crime was that he didn't keep records of who his margarine buyers were and who his margarine sellers were. And uh, like, you know, any good margarine dealer, nobody ever rats out their source. And he didn't, he didn't flip and become a government witness and cooperate on the margarine dealers up the chain, but he did become a federal criminal uh, because of that. Now, what about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act? That's a good statute because it's geared at doing one thing, which is preserving a species, a number of species. We have lots of birds that were at risk of extinction. And so Congress acted, but when they acted, they did something that's a real problem, which is they passed a statute, 16 USC 707, that says it's a, it's a federal crime to fail to comply with any regulation passed pursuant to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Any regulation. So what does that mean? Well, obviously, if you hunt a bird that can't be hunted, that's a federal crime. Fine, we can all get behind that. But what if I told you about something called the Federal Duck Stamp Contest? which every year solicits art from artists around the country where they can submit a painting or a portrait of ducks and mallards and all kinds of, of, of migratory bird species. And the government names one winner and it becomes the official federal duck stamp for the year. Well, they promulgated all of the rules for the duck stamp contest pursuant to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So as a technical matter in the United States, if you submit art of a wrong bird, a non-duck, for example, that's a federal crime. If the judges don't deliberate for at least two hours on submissions, they've committed a federal crime. And if you submit computer-generated art to the federal duck stamp contest, you're also a federal criminal. That probably wasn't done on purpose, but that's how these federal crimes get created, by accident. My position is federal crimes shouldn't get created by accident. Federal criminal law should be reserved for the most severe offenses because it's the only aspect of our law that can take away your liberty, it can take away your right to vote, it can brand you a criminal for the rest of your life, and you shouldn't be able to have folks in Washington accidentally creating things that expose people to criminal prosecution. Now, there's also something called incidental take, and a lot of people might be happy about this because we don't want migratory birds getting accidentally killed. And in fact, in 2013, a utility company, Duke Power, was prosecuted for killing protected birds with its windmills. Well, they didn't mean to do it. They didn't do it on purpose, but some birds were getting killed in the blades of their windmills. And under a theory called incidental take, meaning basically accidentally killing a bird, they committed a federal crime because there really isn't an intent requirement. The Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York once was faced with the question, well, what would happen if a bird flew into my plate glass window at home because I did too good of a job cleaning it and the bird died? Would I be a federal criminal? And the Second Circuit said, well, technically yes, but we're just gonna hope that prosecutors don't charge you for that. So just know, if a bird flies into your window and dies, you have committed a federal crime. Your only saving grace is that prosecutors hopefully won't bring that case. I think that's too much discretion. I think prosecutors shouldn't have that discretion. And ultimately, it's on Congress to change the law to make sure that the people that get prosecuted are criminals, what we think of as criminals. So what does this mean? What, 
you're ready. You're saying, look, I came to this presentation on how to become a federal criminal and you haven't told me how to become a federal criminal yet. I said, well, let's, let's take this example of the bird deaths. Say you've got a bunch of money sitting around and you want to put a wind turbine up in your property. Well, here's a good example. Put the wind turbine up and just put it there. And everybody knows how a wind turbine works, right? You put birds and wind into it and then out the other side comes blood, feathers, and electricity. Congratulations, you're a federal criminal. But what if you're not well healed enough to have a windmill on your property? I got a good example for you. You can commit a federal crime with something as simple as the humble ham and cheese sandwich. And in fact, you can become a federal criminal with two different federal agencies, depending on where in the lifespan of your ham and cheese sandwich you are. Take, for example, the bread. Well, that's regulated by the FDA. So you go home, everybody's stuck in quarantine right now at the time that we're making this. Um, lots of folks are making sourdough bread at home. I'm seeing it all over social media. Well, the FDA wants to make sure that that bread is federally compliant. So you make non-compliant bread for your sandwich and the FDA is gonna come knock down your door and haul you off to prison. But what if you put a piece of ham on it? Well, that ham is regulated by the USDA. So that's a different food regulating federal agency. And they can also break down your door and haul you off to prison for your non-compliant ham. All right, but what happens when you take that bread and you take that ham and then you put a piece of cheese on top of it? Under federal law, there is an actual federal regulation that defines this as an open-faced ham and cheese sandwich and a regulation that expressly designates open face ham and cheese sandwiches into the jurisdiction of the USDA. So once you've made an open face ham and cheese sandwich, the USDA is gonna be all over you if it's non-compliant. But how do you get out from under the USDA violation? I've got an answer for you. You just put another piece of bread on top of it because once you put a second piece of bread on an open face ham and cheese sandwich, under federal law, it becomes a closed face ham and cheese sandwich and now the FDA is the federal regulator. So you can really pick and choose who you wanna get in trouble with just by how much bread you put on, what kind of meat you put on and when you put it on. This does speak to a broader problem. And this is the problem that I try to humorously touch on in the book, which is there's no intent requirement for a lot of these crimes. You can commit a crime by accident. That is a problem because when people take it on faith, have to take it on faith, that when they go about their day, when they make a product that they're gonna sell, uh, you know, some food product or something, they wanna go to a bake sale, they wanna do whatever, they don't know for sure whether or not they're actually violating some federal law. For example, it's a federal crime to leave New York with an unshucked ear of corn. So if you stop at a farm stand in New York and drive into Connecticut with an ear of corn, um, and it's unshucked, you've committed a federal crime. Now, if you shuck it, it's no longer a federal crime. But in my experience, if you're driving down the road and a police officer sees you crossing the border at 80 miles an hour with corn husks flying out of your uh, window, uh, you're probably gonna get in some trouble and they might catch you on a federal crime. It's too late at that point. Get yourself a good vegetable lawyer. There's also conflicting executive branch positions on enforcement, right? Under the bird death, accidental bird death statute I talked about. Under the Obama administration, they said, look, we're just gonna trust prosecutors not to charge those cases. Under the Trump administration, the Trump administration has said, we actually don't think that incidental take should be a federal crime. Nothing in the law changed, nothing in the regulation changed, but depending on who's president, who's prosecutor, and who you are, they can decide whether or not you're a federal criminal or not. So in other words, you could sit down and read all of the 300,000 federal crimes on the books, and still not know whether you're gonna be charged because that depends very much on the whim of a prosecutor or a president or somebody else in the executive branch that you have never met. The language of the law can also defy common meaning and that's sort of a, that's sort of a tricky thing. Take for example, migratory birds. They don't have to be migratory. So you might look at a bird and say, I can do whatever I want to that bird because I know for a fact that mockingbirds don't migrate. Well, that doesn't matter because they're on the federal migratory bird treaty list so it is a federal crime to kill a mockingbird. Compliance with these countless federal crimes uh, and these federal rules, it's impossible, it's expensive. Um, I can tell you better than anybody that lawyers are ridiculously expensive and the average person is not setting aside a war chest in the event that they end up on the wrong side of the law. And it, and it also raises a concern that I get very concerned with. 
which is the ability for the federal government to pick the defendant first and then pick the crime later. In other words, if the government gets any reason to look into your life, if there's 300,000 federal crimes that cover virtually any aspect of American life, isn't it possible that somebody who's sufficiently motivated could decide that you, they want you to be a criminal and then find out how later? Now, with respect to public opinion, as the scope of criminal law increases, the ability to comply decreases, but so does respect for the law because it's very easy to say, you know what, that's a federal crime just like anything else is. That environmental violation, which really does hurt people and destroys the environment, yeah, that's a federal crime, but you know what, so is selling runny ketchup. So honestly, who cares? That's what you don't want to have happen. You want to have a knowable federal law. You want to have crimes that are clearly defined so that folks can't later then say, you know, should that really be a crime? Because it, in, it increases the validity of the law, the more knowable it is. Plus, our Supreme Court has repeatedly said, ignorance of the law is no excuse. And when the law is unknowable, but the law also suggests that you are presumed to know it, that also is an unsettling thing for a lot of people. So I've made some proposed solutions. You know, one of the solutions is to repeal some old antiquated unconstitutional statutes. Congress doesn't have much of a political will to do that. I've suggested a default mens rea, meaning if you wanna become a federal criminal, you should have to intend to be a federal criminal. And then maybe give less deference to the various agencies. If they write a bad, vague rule, the courts shouldn't defer to the agencies. They should apply the rule of lenity and suggest that if a person truly was acting in good faith and did not know they were running afoul of the law, that they shouldn't be made a federal criminal for that. Here's an example of proposals that have been made over the year. Back in 2019, this was made, clean up the code act. They said, let's get rid of things like the denture crime or misuse of Woodsy Owl or misuse of Smokey the Bear, or even let's make it not a crime anymore to pretend to be a member of 4-H which is shocking to me because I spent a lot of my childhood pretending not to be a member of 4-H. But if you pretend to be a member of 4-H, you've committed a federal crime. There's not even enough political will to go through and eliminate these statutes. So how are we ever gonna get comprehensive reform? In fact, bipartisanship is part of the issue. They can't agree on anything in Washington. The best they've been able to do is they recently made it a crime to eat your cat or your dog. And so that's really where we are. They said, can we repeal old laws that don't make any sense anymore? No, we're not there yet, but we can agree not to eat our pets. That's, that's the state of bipartisanship in Washington right now. So law enforcement has even said, we don't want all these statutes. Here's some transcripts from, from the FBI going to Congress and saying, we don't want these silly laws. We don't want these ridiculous laws. We wanna focus on the real stuff. And Congress said, no, you're keeping them. We're not getting rid of these laws. They're staying in your jurisdiction. And so in my book, I talk about all kinds of ways to become a federal criminal. By mail, you can't even dress up as a postman. So if you wear a letter carrier's uniform, even on Halloween, there is no exception. The only exception is for actors. And that's, um, that's how uh, Newman from Seinfeld gets away with it. But I will say at the time that Cliff Clavin was dressing up as um, a, a mailman on Cheers, it was still a federal crime. So uh, John Ratzenberger, uh, if you need some help, give me a call. Uh, Animals, that's another way to commit federal crime. So whatever you do, don't shoot a fish from an airplane. That's a federal crime. I've always been of the view that if you can hit a fish uh, with a shot from an airplane, you should get to keep the fish and you shouldn't go to prison, but it's still a federal crime. And how about money? Well, uh, people often wonder, is it, is it a federal crime to write on money or deface money? Well, when Hillary Clinton was on the campaign trail at one point, somebody came up to her and said, um, Mrs. Clinton, will you sign this dollar bill? I, I want a memento, will you sign this? And Hillary Clinton said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. That's a federal crime. And the, the voter's response was, really? Because I just talked to Bill Clinton over there and he already signed it. So you know, there was a little bit of a misunderstanding there, but uh, you probably won't be prosecuted unless you deface too much of the dollar. What about food? Well, one of my favorite is cheese crimes. It is a federal crime to sell Swiss cheese with no holes, so keep a lookout for that. Federal crimes with alcohol. Remember, there are distinctions in the law that are important. If you're on public land, federal public land, it is a federal crime to be annoyingly drunk. But if you're delightfully drunk or hilariously drunk, that's not within the text of the law. So just keep that in mind and choose your drinks carefully. And then also there's federal crimes that you could commit on federal property. Did you know that it's a federal crime to abuse the furniture at the Library of Congress? 
It's also a federal crime to have offensive personal hygiene at the Library of Congress. And so, you know, that's kind of a catch-22 because at the same time, it's a federal crime to bathe in the fountains at the Library of Congress. So if you get there with offensive personal hygiene, there's not really much you can do about it because you can't go bathe in the fountains. There's a lot of crimes you can commit at the Library of Congress, and I talk about them in the book. Then federal crimes that you can commit on the high seas. We talked a minute ago, and I'll just close with this. We talked a minute ago about vague, antiquated laws. Well, a long time ago, we had sort of a pirate problem in the United States. And there were a group of people called crimps, and they were on the Barbary Coast in San Francisco, and they were also on the New York Coast. And they knew that if people got off of a ship, before the ship arrived at shore, they would forfeit their whole wage for the journey. And most of those folks that were working on those ships were drug addicted, alcoholic, and they were desperate for a drink or a drug. And so the sailor runners would take a little dinghy out to the ships as they were arriving. They would offer drugs and pornography and uh, prostitutes back on shore to the women or to the men on the, the ships. And they would be so desperate that they would jump off the ship and they would come back and, and, and spend some time at a boarding house. But they'd forfeited their wage, so they were destitute. And they entered into agreements with those boarding house owners that they would give them essentially uh, a, a wage, a cut of their next um, commission on a ship. So the sailor runners would then basically sell those men back to journeys and take 80% of their wage for the next journey. And it was a form of slavery and piracy and it was problematic. So what did Congress do to solve the problem? Well, they didn't say, uh, let's pass a law that says it's a federal crime to piratically seize a person and stake their wage or anything like that. They just passed a simple statute. It's a federal crime to board a ship that's about to arrive at shore but hasn't yet. That's it. That's all the statute said. Federal crime to board a ship that's about to arrive but hasn't yet. And that stayed on the books for hundreds of years. And then even after we stopped having a pirate problem, you know what happened? Nobody used the statute, but nobody repealed it either. And then in 2005, some Greenpeace activists got into a dinghy and decided to go unfurl a banner on the side of a ship coming in from Brazil that said, stop har harvesting illegal mahogany. President Bush, stop harvesting illegal mahogany. But they weren't successful. They tried to get up on the ship. They got overtaken by the crew and they never unfurled their banner. Well, they thought maybe they'd committed some sort of disorderly conduct, misdemeanor, something, right? Wrong. Federal prosecutors charged them with the early boarding statute that was intended for pirates because as a technical matter, they met all the elements. They boarded a ship that was about to arrive, but hadn't yet. And when they went to the judge, they said, judge, I think this is kind of a mistake. This is a pirate statute. We're not pirates, we're environmental activists. And the judge said, well, that's just as bad. No, that's not what he said. But what he said was, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do to dismiss your case because you met technically each element of the federal crime on the books. And so they all became federal criminals. To this day, they have federal criminal records because they technically violated a statute never intended for them. So that's part of the problem, is these vague old laws stay on the books and they give a tremendous power to the federal government to criminalize conduct. And so I'd ask you, I hope you'll go out and get a copy of the book. The book is even more lighthearted than what I've talked about here today. I've got illustrations on how to make runny ketchup, uh, how to import a pregnant polar bear, um, all kinds of things, how to be an annoying drunk on public land as we discussed. And I'll go through that whole process page by page with illustrations for each. Uh, but anyway, I, it's, it's been a real honor to be able to have this talk. I, I hope that folks do go out and get the book and get a kick out of it. And you can also follow Crime A Day on Twitter at, at Crime A Day for a daily dose of these ridiculous federal crimes. This is great, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has really been very interesting and the book is delightful. It's well illustrated with all the practical tips you'll ever want or need on how to become a federal criminal. So uh, Mike, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you and we'll see everyone next time at uh, the American Museum of Tort Law video series. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks.